Today's video is about Libra Photos, which is a self-hosted open source photo management service. And it is actually forked from Own Photos, which is one of those applications that ran under Own Cloud, I think it was called, which is in itself forked to Nextcloud. But it should have a sort of a similar look and feel to that. As I did in the last video, which I did around image, I'm going to be contrasting or comparing it with PeeWeeGo, which is what I've been using for my own photo hosting. Well, I'm still using actually up to now. I haven't quite moved to image yet. But my use case has been very much around sharing albums of photos with my family. And then I've also got a couple of albums where I've visited general places and other things which I share publicly on the internet. So if you go to my website, you will see some public facing albums. And if you log in, or as a login as a family or a friend member, then you're going to see some of the private albums which I share with them. So I'll still be using that as sort of the comparison when I'm looking at Libra Photo. So your you know, use case may vary a little bit, but hopefully you, know, you can still identify with it. So what I'll be looking at really mainly, first of all, is just sort of some of the key features in a slide. And I'm going to move on to another slide covering potential shortcomings as I see it or you know, as, I, as I use it. Then we'll do a demo just of what I've set up for the hosting. And we'll finish off as usual with sort of a tour of what available menu settings and options there are. I will also just be covering on one of these slides some resource usage and one or two other things that I've picked up, you know, with my installation of it. So looking at features, first of all, it does cover all the major file formats, including RAW, uh, HEIC, HEIF and videos as well. So that's pretty, pretty normal. It has got an option you can turn on for videos to transcode by default, you know, or retranscode, should I say, into a, into a format that is optimized for Libra Photos. Quite importantly here, especially when you're comparing to image, it's not intended as a Google Photos alternative. It doesn't punt itself as that sort of alternative like image does. It is multi-user, so you can add additional users, you know, family, friends, that sort of thing. You know, you could, I, I thought about this afterwards possibly, you could actually create one user called public with password public maybe, and then share some of your albums to that user with the intention that that would be the public user. But the thing is, people would have to log in and you'd have to have some other message on the landing screen to say, you know, log in with public public. Otherwise, People aren't going to know sort of how to find something. And if they click on a link to look at a photo, it's not going to appear. The other thing, just like all the other services, it's got facial recognition and classification. I think the settings did give you a couple of tweaks and options as well, which we'll look at there. It has got public URL link shares for photos. So in other words, you can certainly for a photo, create a public link, share that link out to anybody or post it on a, tw a tweet or a or an X, or any other social network, Mastodon, Fediverse, that sort of thing, and people will be able to view it. I have actually tested it, and you can turn that link on and off. It keeps the same link, which is quite useful. It does do slideshows, but it's not the automated type of slideshow where you know, you've got a five second pause automatically between photos. If you just click right, click right or left, you can control the slideshow. What is nice, and this is something I think I seem to remember Image didn't have, was you can filter on recent uploads. Because the problem I had there was, like I tested now in this scenario, was I uploaded something that was like two years old. Question was, does it appear at the top? And if it doesn't, like Image doesn't, how do you find that photo quickly to edit or work on it? So there is definitely a filter for that. And there are a couple of other, other useful filters as well for photos. So we'll look at that as soon as we dive into the interface. Uh, geolocation, yes, you can see on a map as well. Slight difference was I'm not really seeing the pins showing up on the map, but definitely as you zoom in and move around, the filter of photos that are associated with that location does show, and we'll look at that. It's got semantic or contextual type search as well as a metadata search. So in other words, metadata being, you know, the lens type, or millimeter lens or f-stop or whatever the case is you could do searches on. It's got an object and a scene detection as well, which it does automatically. And then you can actually go and view by those scene or object detections. It's not 100%, but we'll have a look at it and you can see what you think of it. It's got automatic captioning, 
with three different options, as I recall. The third one I didn't use because it had very heavy resources, but I tried both of the first two and it wasn't working for me, but I'll show you where it's supposed to work and where the settings are where you activate it. And it may just be a glitch that I've got on my installation, but I couldn't get that to work. It has got duplicate detection. If you upload the same photo two or three times, it doesn't upload it. Unfortunately, there's no message, but it doesn't duplicate the uploads. It can scan and write to an external location, and it specifically links to a Nextcloud login. So that's quite handy if you've got your photos sitting on Nextcloud. You can set the login ID and password, and it will pull that in as a source for the photos. And I, th I haven't tested actually whether it works together with the external location. I don't think it's an either or. I would imagine it uses both sources. The external location is quite interesting, and we can talk about that when we get down to the Docker installation here. Just remember, wherever you're hosting it, it's going to need access to, to those photos. But what I did here was I used my Piwigo location, or the volume location of where my photos are sitting, and I pointed it to that, and it quite successfully retrieved the photos. So that is certainly possible, or as I said, you can have any other location that you can map to from the Docker container you'll be able to work with. Another interesting feature is for metadata updates or changes, you can get it to sync back to either an XMP sidecar file or into the XF of the image itself. Unfortunately, I'm actually finding that this is not always really working 100% across all the different services, which is a real pity. Um, you know what I've been trying to do again, I've been testing, for example, when you import a photo, that already has got captions or titles or certain things. Why can't it bring that in? None of them seem to read and write that properly. So again, with Libre Photos, that's also not working, just like with Image. And it means essentially that if you're importing 10,000 photos, you know, you're going to have to recaption all of them again. Then on the mobile app side, it has got two Android apps, both in beta release. One is their own native app, and the other one was a third-party app but they are apparently working fine. And then the last thing just to mention is they do actually have a Raspberry Pi 3 or greater image available for installing. It does have to be 64-bit Pi, otherwise it's not going to handle the processing. And then as I've done a Docker installation as usual, and maybe what we can just do is just have a quick look at the two Docker files, just in case anybody else has any issues or problems with it. So this is the environmental file. So how they've set up Docker, just to give you sort of the overview here, is I use Portainer. So I tend to use a stack file. And usually you'll just type everything into that stack, you know, complete with passwords, database names, etc. They and Image use a slightly different format. They've got a stack.env file, which is sort of a text file with some of these settings in it. And this is what you edit and you change. And that will populate the Docker Compose file. So I'm starting with the stack.env, which is sort of like an environment file. This stuff I didn't change because it's really the location inside the container itself. And by the way, this is on paste and I will put links to it below the video as well. But I think this is fairly key, obviously, the worker file. So this is basically how many services like machine learning and caption reading, scanning, et cetera, can run at the same time. So just remember, it says default is two. I would almost have made this one because I found the resources quite heavy. But if you've got a punchier machine, you can up this and then you know do more of those things concurrently. I did change things like my database name. That is the name of the database that is created inside the Postgres file. That's the database username. There's a password. Obviously, you put your own password in there. I didn't change any of this. The DB host is the container name for the host. Now, what's important here is that all of these containers are changed because they've named them by default DB, backend, frontend, proxy, and PG admin, I think it was. These can often clash with other services or containers that you're running. So this is basically how you go about it. You name them over here uniquely, and I'll show you in the Docker Compose file just now how you match that. And that was really it as far as the ENV file goes. Let's just have a look at the Docker Compose file. 
there is the link. The Docker Compose, you don't have to change much of the details. So I'm really going to go over really all I changed. I did, I left proxy as called proxy um, because this is really just what executes. It's not actually that important. But the container name and the host name, I put the prefix Libra photos underscore proxy there. Uh, this all gets pulled in automatically. I did hard code this location. And what's important here is this is how I got it to see my Piwigo photos. I told it that on the inside of this container, it must have slash data, which is its default location for photos. Of, but I said, let's make it slash data slash Piwigo just to give, put it into a subdirectory. And this is what I pointed to, which is a physical location on my VPS server, which is hosting all the Docker containers. So this points to where my Piwigo gallery photos actually are. And that is how I get, well, you'll see just now how I get that sort of pick list of, of directories to pick. I specified the environment file over here, that stack.env. Uh, I've also changed it here to, to give it my own network. I've got an existing Docker network called mysql.dash.net. And that is just because my Nginx proxy uses that. Otherwise, I can't point to the container. I left all this standard, depends on his standard. Okay, this in my case is just because I run Watchtower to see if there's any updates. And you'll see here is a difference. I've named this here LibreScore underscore DB, the service. And again, I've also changed the container name and host name there. The rest is pretty well much the same. I think the rest was all standard. Again, the Watchtower. Uh, the back end, really just the name over there again. This, it all pulls this in again from the environment file. You don't have to change anything there. And that's really it. The only other thing is I specified my network and told it not to go create a new network because that network does already exist. I should just say on Docker before I leave there, on Nginx proxy, because I've got my own Nginx proxy as a reverse proxy, I did point it to the proxy container but the important thing is I use the internal port port 80 not the externally facing port otherwise you'll get an error message so just remember that because I'm using container name port 80 and that is how I address it from my nginx proxy then everything works fine that was the docker installation let's move on then to the potential shortfalls this is compared then to Piwigo, but this is January 2024, so this could very well change in the future. What I did notice was it was fairly resource heavy, and that is compared to the other services. I realized that obviously the initial scan is always going to be a bit heavy, but I did some benchmarking with Piwigo and Image, and I can just briefly show you what I found. And the methodology that I followed was that I had it idling, I opened an album. I scrolled down, I scrolled back up, and then I clicked back on the main photos view and I left it for a short while just to see how it recovers and so on. And, and that is the same methodology that I followed for all three. So let's just have a look then at Libra Photos. As you can see up there, there it shows that it is the Libra Photos container. And this is sort of the stats that you can see there really. The memory usage shows there 1.6 gig while it was idling and in fact it dropped slightly to 1.4 when I was doing the actions but it went back up again to 1.6 so that is how much memory it's basically consuming when the service is idling. The CPU usage, so this is obviously sort of relative CPU usage I would imagine because it's my VPS server can't run at 180% but it peaks at 180% for the both of those actions and you can see it does drop down to basically zero so that that's actually a fairly good sign I suppose so just to keep in mind then 1.6 gigs of memory and peaking at about 180 percent if we look at image you'll see here that it was idling at about 120 megabyte of RAM. And while I was busy doing those actions, it went up to about 165, 170 megs of RAM. And it also dropped fairly quickly as well afterwards. CPU usage, 
on the browsing of the album, it shot up to about 70%. And then going back to photos, it utilized about 40% RAM and it dropped quite quickly back to zero and it was idling. So for Piwigo, which you can see at the top there, it was idling at about 60 megs of RAM and it went up to 80, yeah, about 90 when I went back to photos, about, about 80, 90 megs of RAM. It took a little bit longer to drop. Unfortunately, I didn't keep it on long enough, but it does drop again a bit after this, after about a minute or two. So it's a bit slower to drop than image. And then interesting on the CPU usage, it mainly was for the opening and the browsing on the album that it shot up to 120, but fairly quickly and it dropped again. And you can only see a very small peak when it went back of about 20% when it went back to the photos view. So, you know, there you have it on the, the RAM and the CPU side. I can just show the glances view, which is keeping an eye on the total VPS that's actually running. Just as a matter of interest, if you look here at the CPU and the memory usage, you see there the Libra Photos backend, which is the server. Okay, memory is not going to show very accurately here, but CPU was about 2.3 while well, it was idling and 1.4 gigs of RAM. The image server. 0 0.2 and about 97 megs of RAM, way less than LibrePhotos there. And Piwigo was showing 0 CPU and 90 megs of RAM. So again, that just gives another sort of a view of, you know, that resource usage. And then just regarding space usage, you can see here this slash 92 is actually LibrePhotos and it's using 5.9 gigabytes of space. Now, I think this was actually just thumbnails and stuff, but essentially that's what it is scanned from the PWIGO, which is in a different location. And just doing the scan with the machine learning and various of the other things, that is the space that it's consuming. The slash 91 is actually image. Now, image is less. It's 41 gigabytes. And I had a look at what image is actually storing. It is actually, it looks like it's pulled across all the JPEGs and the HEIC files and the XMP sidecar files. So for whatever reason, both of them are pointed at the same location. But storage wise, like I say, image is using, what's that, nearly two gigabytes less than Libra Photos. Let's just have a look at Piwigo. Uh, this is for Piwigo, and you can see Piwigo's gallery, which is my original gallery, is actually 7.6 gigabytes of storage space. That's the actual space that it uses. But yes, bear in mind, it's also got three gigs of app data. And I didn't count in, for example, image has also got some data, but it's doing 339 megs. And the model cache, which is its machine learning and so on, is nearly a gigabyte. But to be fair, I didn't include Libra Photos as other containers either. So just a sort of a bit of a, a blunt comparison. So as I said, yes, I did note that it was a little bit resource heavy. Then on just on feature wise though, there are no nested albums, in other words, sub albums. I explained before, like I would have had on Piwigo hiking albums as a collection was a main album. And then under that, I would have had all my various hikes or I would have had a places album with the different places underneath as separate sub albums. So you don't have that in uh, Libra Photos and neither did you have it in Image either. There is no album sorting that I could find. In other words, the albums just appear in whatever order they are when you view them. The photos inside an album, the same thing. There is no change that you can make, just like Image. It shows the newest first, which is sort of fine, except you'll be looking at your album backwards. In other words, you'd start at the end of whatever your series of photos is and you'd move down to the first photos at the bottom. 
So there are no public albums. But as I said, you cannot, you can share an album, but you can only share it to a user. So if it's three users, you can choose one, two, or three of those users to share the album with. There's no photo replacement. It's not a major issue, really. But I did explain before that if you've made some changes to a photo, got an improved version, then what you could do on PWego is you could just upload a replacement in its place without changing any of the captioning and various other things. So it's more like just a nice to have. There is no pop-up or mouse over captions. If you hover your mouse over the photos, there's nothing that pops up. You've got to click on the photo, click on the little eye icon to actually view it. There's no compression and resizing, or at least there's no settings that helps you control that, apart from what I said, that the recoding of the video. There's no copyright that you can set per photo, but again, it's not really intended for public sharing, so that's not really relevant, I suppose. And just like image, it's got basic EXIF metadata import. So it, interesting enough, does in, import faves. If you faved a photo, like I've done in Digicam on my hard drive, when I uploaded the photo, it actually came into Libra Photos and it showed it there as a favorite. So that's quite interesting. It does read the fave. It does read date, time, geolocation, and all the camera settings quite 100%. But as I said already before, no captions or titles get brought in. There's no export from Digicam. Not a major thing, but I did originally say that in Digicam, you can do all your ch changes. You can set your captions, your change your geolocations or delete them or whatever, and you can select and just export straight into PWego or to Google Photos or whatever, but you could not do it for image and you can't do it for Libra Photos. This one is a little bit worrying for me because there is no comments at all on photos or no notifications. Well, there are no comments to be notified of, but this could be, for example, if somebody shares an album with you, you're not going to get a notification. I've tested that already. I don't see it. So why the comments would have been nice was both PWego and Image, if you've shared that with some couple of other users, they can also then comment on those photos. Others can see the comment and reply to them and that sort of thing. So very nice for collaborating with family or whatever. So that is just something that is not in Libra Photos, or at least not yet. And then the other downside for some is going to be there is no iOS app. They do say there that from the source code, an app can be built. Most average users are not going to be able to do that. And iOS is notoriously difficult to, to actually compile something for and install it on your phone. So that is going to be a little bit of a problem. Obviously, anybody can produce one and put it on the, on the store, but that is a, a small problem still. So yeah, let's dive into the actual GUI interface. The default view is going to be here. Uh, on the photos view. So I'm going to deal with this first and go through some of it. And then we can come back and go through albums and some of the other options. If you click over here where this little drop down is next to photos, this is what I said you can actually filter on, for example, recently added. I mean, if I go down here, you're going to see there are no other photos. If I go to recently added, it was a photo that I uploaded today, but it's from a couple of years ago. There it already had the fav favorited, the yellow star but you can get a quick view this is what i uploaded today or you can go back to you know the default view and you've got others you can filter on what you've hidden you can filter on your favorites you can filter on just photos just videos or what is what are my public photos and i have shared a couple of public photos i'll show you how to do that just now That's in essence the view. And then to do some controls, you see on the top left, there's a little selection. You can choose multiple photos if you want to. And the drop down over here on the right hand side is going to show you things like you can favorite it, you can unfavorite it, you can hide or unhide. Now, understand what the hiding and unhiding is, it, it'll, it'll hide it from your view. And you can obviously unhide it again. You can make something public or you can make it private. Now, if you make it public, then other logged in users should be able to see the photo. And we'll have a look. We can have a look at that just now as well. You can download the photo or photos. You can move it to trash. That is where you would share the photo. And you'll see there, I've got a user called test at the moment. You can share or unshare it. And you can search for users, but, but that is it otherwise over there. 
if you make public, it actually copies the link to your clipboard and you can paste that and actually share it if you want to. But I've also noticed if you go and take the full link of the photo, if you've opened it up, you can even share that as well. And it'll also, if it has been publicly shared, somebody will be able to read the, the photo. So yeah, that's really it. You can set it as an album cover if it's in an album. And that is album sharing. But I'll, we can look at those when we go into albums just now. The other option is if you've got a selected um, photo you, or couple of photos, you can click on this plus button and you can add it to albums. I've got three existing albums there, but you could also just type in there and create and make a, a new album if you want to. So that is very much the photo view. Now let's just have a look at a photo itself. If you click on the photo, what I meant by the slideshow was you can click on the right hand side for next and back. That is basically how you would do a slideshow. And you've got a couple of options up here at the top. This was to hide, un unhide it. Let me just go a bit closer there. Hide, unhide it. That is to fave or unfave. This one is publicly shared at the moment, but you could toggle it off. Zoom in, zoom out, and close. And then you've got a little information button over here. If you click on that information button, you'll see the photo's got a location. This is a photo that I've actually uploaded. It's not one of my imported photos, but eventually you see the same things. You've got a location, you can show more metadata over there. That's also the physical location where the file is saved on the server or on the container. You've got a caption over there and you can click there to edit the caption and you know just click or to cancel it. It's got what it's found here as the scene side and well I don't know it's not to me perfectly good I mean this isn't really eating it's not reading either. Uh, it's actually an open area. It's got both open and enclosed. Beer garden, beer hall, I suppose, is good. Those are its guesses for scenes and for categories. And you can't manually change this or set this. And you also can't add tags of your own. So you can forget about custom tags. I think image was exactly the same. You couldn't add your own tags to sort of create your own custom views out of it. But yeah, that basically is is it for the photo. Let me just go to another photo that doesn't have a caption, say this one. Now, how you, I did explain how you edit the caption, you know, by going there and you'll see now it changes to a little wand. This should actually generate, by clicking on it, it should be generating that auto caption based on the scene. But I let the thing spin a couple of times, nothing happened. I've also changed, as I said, the, the model or the, um, yeah, the machine learning model or whatever the case was for the captions and it hasn't made any difference it just hasn't brought anything back no bad guess no good guess so i'm not sure exactly i'm sure it probably is just a little bug but you'll see in the settings i have got everything activated and selected so yeah okay that's not really going to do anything right now so we can close that okay that really is the photos view if you want to upload a photo, you will just go to this plus arrow at the top here and you could choose to upload a photo there. So let's look at albums next. So albums, if you click on it, you can choose from people albums, places, things, my albums, which I've created, and then auto created albums, which it uses its machine learning for. So if I go to people, I have got two faces that I've recognized. And what it's done is it's built up albums just with those faces. So it's not going to work for faces that you haven't yet labeled or recognized. Okay, waiting. Okay, this is probably a generated view. Maybe that's why it's taking a little bit longer. But again, you'll see it, it, it is quite sort of laggy. Okay, so there it comes up. I had to actually refresh it and I just cut that because it was taking, it was just spinning. Um, but now that it has actually loaded up, you'll see it is just then a sort of a filtered view by that person. 
Uh, I can go to places. So on places, you'll see here, I don't know why it's showing, that, that's normally zero, zero latitude, longitude. So it could be that some photos there, you're not seeing any photos here at the moment, okay? Which is funny because if there are photos that are tagged in that, you should be seeing them down here. But anyway, as you go up, I'm in South Africa, so you'll see now as I'm over South Africa there, the photos appear. And they're categorized by everything in South Africa, 178, Western Cape, 168, Wellington, one photo, Belleville, seven photos. It's sort of automatically recognized the area. So you could just click onto this view and view those couple of photos, you know, for that particular area. Or you can actually zoom in. And as you move around, you'll see it, it does actually filter. So if I look at, just this view say down here you'll see it's filtered on those areas that do appear here on the map and if I move the map you'll see the photos do change so yeah that is it works quite well for the geolocation it's quite slick works nicely actually then things now it is auto recognized so it's not going to pick it up on your tags you don't have tags here yeah, I took this photo of my wife sitting in a whiskey distillery as a working photo. That's a wood photo. There is actually no wood in the photo. It's bricks in the background. That's probably a warm color. That is a waiting room, quite correct. That's a rose garden, not a vegetable garden. Uh, that's a village. Well, that's actually a city, but leave that. That's not a vineyard. It's a rose garden again. So it's not 100% right. I mean, it's picked up my fresh milk bottle as a ticket booth. These barrels are a temple in Asia. That's a supermarket. So, yeah, I don't know. Sushi bar? No, it's whiskey. So, okay, that's the things view. I'm not going to go much further into that. These are my manual albums that I've created. And if I do open one up, opens relatively quickly. There is no manual sort so i'm in album view at the moment and well there is no sort of drop down or option or anything that i find yet in the album to do like a manual sort or a reorder or anything like that look it looks quite good with the videos playing auto playing uh, that side of it is quite good it's quite slick I and mean, if i open a video uh, photos that's a video play so that's pretty fast It's another video. And then if you've got the photo open, you've got the same options I've shown before up at the top right there. But, oh, now I see on the album, hang on, here is something. Oh, maybe it's got a photo selected because this is not album. There is album actions at the bottom. So you can select a photo, like say that one. You can use that drop down menu and set that as an album cover if you want to. That's how you would do it. But on the sharing side, if I'm under album here, you can only share to a diff another user or you could switch on or off or whatever the case is over there. And on the plus side for albums, well, nothing, nothing happens. You'd have to select some photos maybe. This is inside an album now and you could, well, share to another album really or you've got, as I said before, the same actions there for the photos. So that really is it. No sort. Uh, and nothing else for albums there. Then you've got auto-created albums. Now, this is where it does use a bit of machine learning. And you can optionally say, I want it to include the description and a location. And you can have a person if you want to. So you'll see it says Sunday early morning. It's got no location for that. This one, it said Friday in Alexandra Road and Pinelands because it's found a location there. This has actually got Friday evening with Chantal and Dani in Stockery Road and Langham. Well, I don't know where that is, but that is correct for Belleville. So it's got some things there. So this is the auto-creating, and this is for events there. I think it also had another option for places. But yeah, that's it really for albums. Under the data view, you've got a thing called a place tree. Now, this wasn't working for me. I've left it on for quite a while and nothing seems to have happened. I gather it's supposed to show some view of places I've visited and I've changed these settings here. I've tried, you know, changing these as well. And 
nothing seems to happen. So not sure about that one. The word cloud data is quite nice. It picks it up. Now a lot of this it's picked up from the auto generation scenes and things that it's done. You'll see things like outdoor and dorm room. That's its own generation. It also will pick up from people. So, you know, if you've tagged people, then it's going to show that to you as well. And places. I don't know. Places aren't coming up there at the moment. But this really is the word cloud. So quite nice as well. Uh, there's a timeline view that really shows you over, over what time period your photos have, are from. The social graph will obviously populate as you've got more people. And it's going to show you which people link or appear in this in photos together, which is quite a nice view. And neither image nor Piwigo has got that, actually. And then the face clusters. Um, people with similar looking faces should be grouped closer together in this plot. Click on a point to see the label. So yeah, there's a person. But yeah, that's an interesting view. Faces is worth having a look at here because at the moment, it's under labeled faces there. There are two people with 46 faces recognized and 11 unknown faces. And really what you're going to now do is, if you want to recognize people, you're going to really select by just clicking on the face like that. I've selected these four. And you would go up to, well, you've got options up there for add to an existing face ID or create a new face ID. You can move the faces back to unknown or other. You can delete the face and its thumbnails. That's the face recognition. Or identify similar faces and try find matches. So if I go to plus, you'll see I can choose one of the two existing people and I can just click on that. Or I could have added a new person and it would have added them to that new face. So that's really how you do your face recognition. That's the other person. And there's some of the unknowns. It's not 100% there. I sort of found images probably better, to be honest, if I had to just compare the two. And then there's an inferred view as well. I don't have any at the moment, but I think it's supposed to infer and you can sort by confidence and date and so on as well. And also select and add them. But that is where you're going to be doing your, your face recognition. I did find that, again, I just sort of think that image had done a better job in terms of already sort of clustering the faces ready for use. And I really only had to merge two or three of them to just about finish my face recognition. And then under sharing, you can see here which are your public photos. Uh, I've got five at the moment. And if I click down, that's the ones that I've shared to public. Remember again, these will be ones with a link. So if I open this photo, I can copy its link and just give it out to somebody and they'll be able to see it. Then I've got, well, you've shared. Uh, if I shared any photos with users, no. Albums, yes, I've shared one album with one user, and that is the album. Then also shared with you is going to be where if somebody else has shared an album or photos with you, you'd go to the share with you view. But OK, I haven't shared with myself, but the other user will, will see it under there. And of course, you can also just trash over there. Storage, just like image, it shows the entire server, the VPS. So it's not the storage used by Libra Photos itself. And obviously, the link to the documentation and the link to support them. I just want to show something, two other things here quickly on the main photo view. If you move to the right, the right hand side of the screen, you'll see here also appears a sort of a little bit like Google Photos and image. You've got a sort of a timeline that you can uh, move down, but it doesn't just scroll on the timeline. You've got to sort of scroll the photos down. But that's the one thing. Then I just wanted to show you a test on, on the search. I'm going to do the same sort of search that I did really on image just to see what it comes up with. If I use something like the word car. Well, no image is found. Okay, that's not so good. If I go to blue, no image is found. Okay, well. Okay, I've searched for sky and it's brought back these. So that doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever, to be honest. 
Let's search for whiskey as I've got whiskey. I've only got one or two that have got captions filled in so far. And that might be one or two of these. But I mean, that's because I've got this captioned as a whiskey barrel. That's probably the reason why. Um, word whiskey experience. That's not too bad. But there are actually, I think, a few more photos of whiskey. But whiskey hasn't worked out too badly. Let me just have a look back here again and see. What else did we have? We could put animal, maybe, to see. Okay, nothing's come up. Oh, searching animal. Hang on. All right, this is not too bad. It's picked up a couple of things that have got animals in. I think that might have been a video. I don't know. But not all of them. But certainly some have. Phone. You know, that's not a phone. That's not a phone. That's not a phone. So it's possible that it's picking it up from the metadata. In other words, that the word phone or the phone type is in the metadata. That's a possibility. But uh, let's put in, for example, mountain. Okay, that's not too bad. Definitely some. That, maybe that's from a tag or something else that's picked it up. That's got the word mountain in. So, yes, not too bad. Certainly picked some of the things up. Um, I'll go for red. I mean, we've got a red post box there. No images found. Okay, so certainly some things are not as slick on the... I think by searching by people, by caption, if it's in there, a place, for example, those are all going to work perfectly well. So, yeah, that, that's really that, I think. So that's really very much the view. I think we can just look at the menus then, actually. If one clicks up at the right top on your profile there. These are the main options you've got. And I'll actually start with the admin area. So you can allow user registration or not over there. You can allow uploads or not toggle it on and off. I'm not sure about the skip patterns. You can change the map provider as well, the background of the map. There's where you change the captioning model, and the blip one is quite heavy, but I did try both of these and it wasn't working for me in terms of the auto generation of captions. I've chosen the large language model as Mistral. I don't know really what it's, how much it's done. The heavyweight processes, again, that is set to one at the moment. And just remember again, as you add, if you add two or three or four simultaneously, it's going to be 800 megs of extra memory for each one. I haven't done the downloading there, but that's where you create users. You can add new users, change passwords, that sort of thing. And you could also set their scan directory. So let's just have a look at that at the moment. Because that you do have to set. There is the users directory. And if you've mapped correctly for your container, it was going to now allow you to browse down to the subfolders. I've chosen actually just the year 2023, I think it was, or what was in that folder, should I say. But that is where you would actually set the user's folder. And only the admin user can do that. You, you set what that user can actually scan and see. And this will show you if there's any worker logs that are busy working at the moment and how far they are and how long they took to run. So it gives you an idea of how long some of these things did take. So that is the admin area. It's as simple as that. We go back up and click there. You can go to the users settings. And this will be things like you can set the scene confidence. So yes, you can play with this a little bit more and tweak it, I think. On the semantic search max results, it had disabled. I suppose that would be, oh, that would also be maybe why I only see sort of maybe 10 at a time. But I did set it for 10. I could actually set that, say, for 50. On the metadata, this is where you, it's defaults to off, but 
if you do make any changes like to the date time of the photo or something like that you can say to it to save to the xmb sidecar or you could save to the media file which would be the exif data in the image file uh, that's just what you set for it to interpret as a favorite as far as what you score you can set time zone i didn't change album options there there's some of the face settings you can change. So again, you can tweak this a little bit to get it to, to work better, I think. And there's some passing rules which I didn't change. That's where you can tell it to always transcode videos. And this is where the language models are. And you'll see there I have got enabled large language model for captions. And I've got add locations to the captions. But as I said, still they weren't really working. So that is the settings menu. If we go to profile, now this is quite odd because I have multiple times chosen the image. It appears here, I say upload, but if you look up here at the profile, it's still blank. It just never seems to take it. So that's almost to me like a permission issue possibly. Uh, yet if I'm uploading files, they do up, uh, uploading photos, they do actually upload. So that's not really the problem. I'm not too sure what the issue there is. That's where you could change your password, you could set your thumbnail sizes, color scheme to light or dark, and you could change your language. And I see it's got a translation feature. And the other, the last menu really is your library. On library, it's just basically showing you for your scan directory that you've got, you've got 259 photos, you've got three people recognized. It's Oh, sorry, three people labeled. You've got 57 faces recognized. You've got 12 of those auto-generated events and 19 different days worth. You can do a manual scan there if you want to. You can generate your event albums. You can regenerate event titles. You can go there to train faces and you can rescan faces. And this is where you'd put in your login details for your Nextcloud if you're going to link it to Nextcloud and you could scan for your Nextcloud photos if you've got that as a location. Yeah, that is pretty well otherwise it for Libra Photos. Um, I can maybe just show you their GitHub site quickly before we sort of finish off. Uh, just to give an indication there, you'll see the updates literally have happened last week and so on. It uh, uh, looks like from the license, it could be a seven-year-old project, but it is quite actively maintained. The developer, I see, talks about another seven or eight plus people that contribute actively and that also assist with it. So it's uh, certainly very active. Um, 271 open issues at the moment. So it's quite a couple, but uh, that's fine. That means people are using it and they are reporting, you know, improvements or queries or whatever the case is so nothing wrong with that really i see it's got 274 forks 6300 stars it's been starred quite a popular application but yeah um that's really all i can show at this stage i mean if i just sort of had to rate them it's got a nicer interface than piwigo piwigo is very dated on its interface side piwigo still got by far the most powerful options and um, functionality through its third party plugins and then image is probably more similar to google photos it's the fastest blindingly fast attractive look and feel if you want to have a look at that look at my last video um, but I think Libra Photos has still got a lot of potential. It's modern as well. It's got a nice modern interface. Uh, it's a little bit heavier on resources. That is a little bit of a concern. You'd have to keep an eye on that and to see. I, remember, I'm running quite a few things on my virtual private server. So it's possible also that it's, it's competing with everything else as well. Um, but it can be tested on a Raspberry Pi. I would say it's tested, scale up and see how it goes from there. But yeah, I hope you found it sort of interesting. And all that I can say then is stay safe out there and thanks for watching and I'll see you in my next video.